Hello grade 11s and welcome back to part 3 of electromagnetism past paper exam questions. If you missed part 1 and 2, check out the links in the description box below for all the different questions that I do cover on this section. Please subscribe for more physics, chemistry and maths videos. Let's jump right into the video. In this question, we have a circular coil. You can see that it's circular from the picture. And they say that it has 250 windings or turns. So if you can recall the formulas that we use, that would be N in the formula and a radius of 0.04 meters. Now remember a circle contains a center of the circle and the line connecting it from the outer side to the center, that's the radius. The radius is helpful in order for us to calculate the area, which you should know is important when calculating things pertaining to electromagnetism and electromagnetic induction and EMF and all that stuff. And it's rotated clockwise inside a magnetic field. So yeah, you can see the lines of the magnetic field and they give me the magnetic field strength. 3,2 Tesla. Remember magnetic field strength is B. That's B in my formula. 9.1, 9.2. Let's jump right in, starting with 9.1. Calculate the magnetic flux through the coil at the position indicated on the diagram where the coil is perpendicular to the field. Now, first of all, when they want me to calculate magnetic flux, that is this symbol over here. And if you take a look at the two formulae given to us for this section in electromagnetism, we've got one over here where we can calculate the EMF, and over here is the one where we calculate the magnetic flux or magnetic flux linkage. We're going to use this formula. We need B, magnetic field strength, A, which is area of the coil, and then cos theta, theta being the angle between the magnetic field lines and the normal to the magnetic field. So first things first, we need to write our blank formula, then we're going to substitute. So we're calculating magnetic flux. B, as I mentioned, is magnetic field strength. So that is 3 comma 2. Now the area is the area of the coil, and we know that it's a circle because they tell me it's a circle, and they give me the radius. So you need to know that the area of a circle can be calculated by using pi times r squared. So I'm going to sub that right in here. We've got pi my radius was given as 0, 0,04 meters. It must be in meters because my area must be in meters squared. That's very important. So if they gave me the radius in centimeters or millimeters or anything else, I would first need to convert to meters. But they give it to me in meters, so it, we're fine. So it's 0, 0,04 squared. So this is B. This over here is the area of the coil. And then we've got cos of the angle. Now, let's just quickly speak about the angle. It says here where the coil is perpendicular to the field. So the field lines are going like this. And the coil, instead of the coil being flat like this, which would be parallel to the field, the coil is like this, perpendicular to the field. But what is actually important is noticing the angle, because this theta is the angle between the field lines and the normal. So it's the angle between the field lines, which is basically these dotted lines over here, and the normal. Now the normal is essentially a it's an invisible, it's not real line, it's not a real line that you can see with your eyes, but if you have a quill like this, so say the quill is like this, the normal is like this, okay, like 90 degrees, an imaginary line that acts like that, perpendicular to the plane of the quill. So if you have a quill that's like this, the normal is like this, 90 degrees. So can you see that in this diagram over here, the normal would be like this, like this. The field lines and the normal are in the exact same direction. So instead of the normal being like this and the field lines being like this, the normal is like this and the field lines are going in like this. So the angle between them is zero. I hope that makes sense. I do have an entire video where I go over this in a lot more detail and a lot slower for those of you that might not understand what my explanation means right now. So check out the playlist link below. But the angle in this case is zero. So, also think of it like this. There's no angle. All the field lines are traveling straight through the coil. So the angle is zero. Type that whole thing into your calculator and you should get 0, 0, 0,016 
Weber or Weber W B. So the full answer on my calculator is actually zero comma zero one six zero eight four nine five and so on. We can round off to two decimal places if we want to. That's the rule in physics. So we could have actually chopped it off there and said zero comma zero two if we wanted to. I just rounded it off to three decimals and you have to have a unit. So you'll get your marks by saying formula, correct substitution, answer with units. My next question leads on from the previous question, which means we're going to use similar information, but it says if the coil rotates clockwise through 25 degrees and the potential difference induced or the EMF induced is 2.8 volts, calculate the time in which this rotation took place. So I hope you're thinking of the correct formula to use, which would be the first formula over here. We are looking for time. We're looking for this over here. We have the induced EMF or potential difference we have n and we are going to have to work out change in magnetic flux so remember the magnetic flux this over here that triangle means change the reason why this changes is because the angle changes so let's do it let's write formula first there we go and now what you can do if you want is this part of the formula change in magnetic flux you can work it out separately and then substitute it in here or you can just do it all in one so basically when working out change i hope you know this by now but change whether it's in physics or chemistry change is always final minus initial and we work out the final magnetic flux by going b a cos theta which would be the final angle, minus you work out the initial magnetic flux by going B A cos initial angle. So essentially, I hope it makes sense that this and this is going to be the same for both of them. The only thing that's changing is actually the angle. So essentially what we're going to substitute in is the following. My N is still 250. It's the number of turns, okay, number of windings. Then change in magnetic flux let's do a big bracket over here so we've got my final magnetic flux so it's b times a times cos of my final angle so b was 3.2 times my a which was pi times 0.04 squared and then my final angle you see we said we rotate clockwise through 25 degrees which means we end up with an angle of 25 degrees relative to the normal so initially here's my normal and all the magnetic field lines are going like this and then we're rotating the quill so that essentially my magnetic field lines are going to come in at an angle of 25 degrees i hope that makes sense so we go cos of 25 and then we do it again but now we're going to do it for my initial minus b a pi times 0.04 squared and then cos zero so if anyone is confused i know i'm using a lot of brackets here but rather use too many brackets than too few brackets so let me just highlight what i'm doing so this is my final magnetic flux worked out with this formula it's all of this over here minus my initial magnetic flux using my initial angle which was zero that's all of that over there that's my n and we're dividing it by time we are trying to work out what the time is and the induced emf or induced potential difference is given over here it's 2,8 volts now i always say this to my students and it's a very helpful tip if you are looking for a variable and your variable is at the bottom of a fraction what you can do in order to solve for that variable is the thing that's at the bottom of the fraction the variable swaps places with whatever is on the other side of the equation so basically we're going to put change in time over here the entire top part of my fraction stays the same and at the bottom we put 2.8 Okay, so just because I didn't want to rewrite that whole thing again, I'm just trying to show you the inverse operations, how we would solve. So what you're going to type into your calculator is basically this entire thing on the top here divided by 2.8. And I get delta T or time, change in time, as being 0, 0,13. And this is in seconds. Now, just a hint, it's very difficult when you type this into your calculator. The best way to do it is actually to type in this part first, get an answer, minus this part, get an answer. You, you'll see that answer ends up being negative, multiplied by negative 250, and then 
take that answer and divide it by 2.8. Okay, so your calculator will do weird things if you don't use your brackets properly and if you don't do your order of operations properly. But this is the correct answer. So you will get marks for your formula, for substituting correctly in two places, and for your final answer. 9.3 now asks which law can be used to explain the phenomenon described in question 9.2 name and state the law so you can't just tell me what law it is you actually have to give the definition now what do they mean what phenomenon are they talking about well if we go back to 9.2 that was the question that we just finished that is when we rotate the coil clockwise so we're moving the coil relative to the magnetic field and what is actually happening we have an emf that is being induced across the the ends of the conductor so they want to know what law explains this and this of course is faraday's law the magnitude of the induced emf across the ends of a conductor is directly proportional to the rate of change in magnetic flux linkage with the conductor unfortunately you do have to learn this definition so i have a whole video explaining faraday's law if you need more information on it 9.4 says if the circular coil is replaced with a square coil with a side length of 0,04 meters. Now remember, the circular coil had a radius of 0,04 meters. They're saying they're replacing it with a square coil where the length of the sides is 0,04 meters. The same movement is made, same amount of time, same angles, all of that stuff. Will the induced EMF be the same, larger than, smaller than? And then you must explain. Now, think about what the circle versus the square means. What does that affect the shape? It affects the area of the coil. If we have a circular coil versus a square coil, how do we calculate the area of a circular coil? It was pi times radius squared. So it was pi times 0.04 squared. Whereas if it's a square coil and the sides are 0.04 meters each, remember square, all sides are equal. So the area is side times side or length times breadth or basically 0.04 times 0.04 or 0.04 squared. Now, compare this area to this area. Are they the same? I know we haven't worked out an answer, but I hope you can see immediately that the square is just 0.04 squared. The circle is 0.04 squared times pi. So immediately, and we know that pi is 1 comma something, something, something. So immediately we know that the area of the circle will be bigger than, greater than the area of the square. And if you think about what implication that has, if we think of the formula for magnetic flux, the bigger the area, if that variable goes bigger, magnetic flux will get bigger because magnetic field strength and the angles, that's staying the same. Okay, so this is how you would answer it. If we use a square coil because the area is smaller, the induced EMF will be smaller. And what I also forgot to mention is that when calculating EMF, we use its negative N and then change in magnetic flux. So if, and we calculate magnetic flux like this, like I just showed you. So basically, if the area is bigger, magnetic flux is bigger. If magnetic flux is bigger, then change in magnetic flux will be bigger. So EMF will be bigger. That's basically what we will say. So if we use a square coil, the EMF will be smaller. That's your first mark. And then you can say the area of the square is smaller than the area of the circle with radius equal to the side of the length. Or you could say you could actually give the calculation like I showed. And then you can say that EMF is then technically directly proportional to area because if area goes bigger magnetic flux gets bigger and if magnetic flux gets bigger the emf induced will increase provided that all the other variables remain constant i hope that this has been a helpful question i can't wait to see you in more videos in the future so subscribe if you haven't yet see you in another video very soon bye everyone